the bite of the mango, chapter 13. Mariatu, Mariatu, Muhammad call out. I was walking back from the clock tower, tired and dusty after a day of begging. All I wanted was some rice and sauce, some vegetables if Abibatu and Marie had prepared any, and then bed. I want to sleep early now, most nights, in preparation for our performance at the soccer stadium. I was so worried I would make a fool of myself, but Mariatta was so thrilled about the event that I didn't want to rain on her parade. Sometimes she got so excited she started jumping up and down, squealing in delight. Her enthusiasm was catching, and we'd jump facing each other, going faster and faster. Her hysteria turned into a game in which we'd see who could jump the highest. Some fancy lady wants to see you, Muhammad gasped. Running up to me, Muhammad's baby fat had disappeared since we'd moved to the camp, and he was growing into a handsome man with a big white smell that could charm anyone. Hurry, he urged, hopping from foot to foot. She's at the tent. She's at the tent. I think it's your time. Adamzi was leaving for Germany in less than a month. About six younger people from the camp had moved to the United States, and several others were on the relocation list. But so far, no one had shown any interest in me. Muhammad, you're such a jokester, I called as we wove in and out of the market stalls, jumping over plastic laundry tubs, boxes, dogs, and cats. Don't get my hopes up. Mariatu, I'm not lying. She's real. This woman is real. She's there at the camp, talking to Marie and Abibatu and asking for you. My heart leapt. What if Muhammad was right? What if I could leave this place full of so much sadness and my days of feeling worthless because I had to beg richer Sierra Leoneans for handouts? Abdul still entered my dreams that night. When I passed other babies at the camp, sung over their mother's backs, I looked away and quickened my pace. Moving to a foreign place might be a remedy for the guilt that still plagued me. Muhammad and I took as many shortcuts as we knew down alleyways, behind and around other people's tents. On route, someone shouted, What's your hurry? It's not like you're going anywhere. I want to shout back at them. Yes, I am. I'm going to the United States. When we got to our tent, Marie was lighting the fire. Standing beside her was a woman wearing a straight brown skirt and a white blouse. She was the same height as Marie, but wider, with short, curly hair. Hello, the woman said when I stopped in front of her. I'm Comfort. Are you Mariatu? Yes, I panted, still breathless from my run. Well then, if you are Mariatu Kamara, I have a message for you. What is it? If you come to my office tomorrow morning, I will give you the message and we can talk about things then. She gave me directions to her office, then went on her way. I stood pondering the possibilities. Would I really be going to this place called the United States, which people said was the best place in the world to live? I could have slept in the next morning, but I got up with a damsy. After my cousins left, I changed into my best clothes, a red Africana docket and lampa. I washed my only shoes, a pair of orange flip-flops, and then set off. Comfort's office wasn't far from the camp. I'd never been in an office building before. The closest I'd ever got to the official-looking places was Stan... Ending at their gates with a damsy, asking business people for money on their way home from work. Usually one of the security guards would order us to get lost. As I walked toward the front door that morning, I half expected the security guard to shoo me away, but he didn't. He smiled and opened the door for me instead. I found the staircase at the end of the hall, right where Comfort had told me it would be, and counted out the four flights to her floor. When I reached the landing, she was there to meet me. Perfect timing, she said with approval. Today, Comfort was wearing a blue Africana docket and lamp with some big brown beads. You look very nice, I complimented her. Thank you, she said. I like to wear both Western clothes and Africana outfits. Comfort's office was a big room full of bookshelves, posters of flowers, and framed certificates of diplomas hung on the walls. When Comfort saw me looking at them, she explained that she was a social worker. She helped people at the amputee camp with non-medical problems, such as reuniting them with their families. Some families are very ashamed of their members who have lost limbs from the war, she said. At first, they don't want anything to do with these people who are disabled. I help the families accept their loved ones. I wondered a little at what she said. Until the day before, I had never seen Comfort at the camp before, and my family got along just fine. 
They didn't view me any differently than they had before the attack. They still bossed me around. Go get some water, Mariachi. Go buy some peppers. Go brush your teeth. I wasn't exactly sure whom Comfort was helping, but I didn't ask. Comfort mentioned, motioned me to a chair beside her desk. A man phoned from Canada, she said, sitting down across from me. His name is Bill, and he wants to find the girl he read about in the newspaper article. Comfort reached over and handed me a newspaper clipping. To my surprise, it showed a photograph of me holding Abdul. Is this you? Yes, I said quietly, starting into the face of my little son. That's me. I had to blink back my tears. Comfort didn't seem to notice my distress. If you are the person in the photograph, this man Bill wants to help you. His family read your story, and they would like to give you money for food and clothes. What is Canada? I asked. Comfort pulled a big book she called the Atlas out from behind her desk. This is North America, she said, running her hand over one of the pages. Canada is a country that sits above the United States. Oh, I said. Is Canada safe? Yes. It's safe there, and it's a rich country. It's also very cold. For half the year, it snows. I had never heard of this new word, snow. Comfort explained that it was like white salt that falls from the sky when it's very chilly. I pictured in my head a cool Sierra Leone night in the spring, with white salt falling all around me. It's cooler than the coldest night here, Comfort said, as if she could read my mind. Don't compare it to any day or night you felt in Sierra Leone. So this man, Bill, is he taking me to Canada? I asked. No, but if you pray for it, maybe he will. I told Marie and Ellie about Bill when I got back to the camp. They were happy for me and also for themselves. They talked about all the food they would buy when the, this man's money started coming in. But I want to go to Canada, I said. I want him to bring me to his place. We'll get fruit, pineapple, and coconut, Ali continued, ignoring me. We haven't tasted such sweetness in a long time. Marie and Ali also mentioned the new houses a nonprofit group from Norway was building for amputees. Ali said we would qualify for the program because four of us in the family were amputees and we didn't have a home. The rebels had destroyed most of the Magbaru homes, including Marie and Ali's hut. Money from Bill, Ali continued, would help us move to a new home. You've done really well, Marie exclaimed, patting me on the back. I left Marie and Ali still talking about Bill. I headed straight to the camp mosque. A few men were praying in the men's section at the front of the large blue tent. I was the only female in our section at the back. I knelt. I put my head on the floor, and I whispered over and over again, Thank you, Allah. A week later, I was back in Comfort's office. I sat nervously on the other side of her desk, waiting for Bill to call on the telephone. I was scared that maybe he wouldn't like me. I didn't speak English, and I worried he would move on to another girl who could communicate with him better. A few girls at the camp who had been to school and learned some words of English there. I knew what a telephone was from the medical clinic in Port Loco. There was only one doctor on staff at the clinic, treating more than 100 patients a day, so the nurses often used a telephone to call Freetown, seeking advice from the doctors there. But I'd never seen a telephone. We didn't have them in our village. We didn't have electricity in our village either, or even a generator. Many people in Freetown used generators when the electricity was out, which happened frequently because of the war. After a few minutes, we heard a ringing sound. Here he is, Comfort said, picking up the top part of the telephone. Comfort talked to Bill for a while. Then she cupped the telephone receiver in her hands and spoke to me. Bill doesn't speak Temne or Kriyos, so you won't understand each other, but at least you can hear what he sounds like. She held the phone up to my ear. Hello, I said in Creo. Cha-cha-cha. Choo-choo-choo, Bill replied. At least that's what his English sounded like to me. My name is Mariatu. Thank you for helping me. I am very grateful, I said in Temne. Comfort took the phone back while she continued her conversation with Bill in English. I looked around the room at the diplomas and certificates. I had seen similar framed papers in the hospital in Freetown. The diplomas said that so-and-so had completed her training, the nurses told me. I had asked one nurse what school was like. 
Sometimes it's very difficult, she said. But going to school opens up new worlds for girls. When you go to school, you can do important things and help other people. You don't have to stay in your village and have a baby after baby. I thought at that time, I'd like to go to school one day. Comfort hung up the telephone and gazed over at me. Bill says he's putting a box of clothes in the mail for you and some money. It should be here in a month. I'll come and get you when the package arrives. The next few weeks were a whirlwind. I eagerly awaited my package from Bill. At the same time, we were participating for our perform- practicing for our performance at the soccer stadium. The theater troupe now met not only on the weekends, but also a few nights each week. Often we ended our rehearsal early to make posters announcing the event. Those who knew how to write and draw designed the posters. The rest of us distributed them throughout Freetown. Victor had given me a line in the HIV slash AIDS skit. Yes, she is such a good woman, I said, to say about the lady who had died from the virus. I was scheduled to be on stage several other times to dance and sing. The morning of our performance, Victor handed out costumes to, that his wife and some other women at the camp had sewn for us for the HIV slash AIDS scene. I would put on an orange Africana outfit. I'd wear a skirt made of rice bags cut into strips when I danced and sang. I was more nervous that day than I had ever been. Victor had hired a, a minibus to take us to the stadium, and we gathered in the main section of the camp a, about an hour before. Are you scared? Mariatu asked me. We folded our costumes into the same black plastic bags we used while begging. Yes, I replied. What if I trip and fall on stage? If you don't fall on your own, Mariatu teased, I'll push you off. You be careful, I teased back, because I plan on pushing you off you before you get to me. We laughed at the picture of the two of us brawling on stage. That's exactly what the government will want to show, the four non-profit people. Mariatu chuckled, two girls wrestling each other. Victor interrupted our giggles. Posters had been tacked on the bulletin boards, the sides of the buildings, and the gates all over town, and he'd heard that about a thousand people were expected to attend our performance, including the heads of the charities that helped us at the camp. My fear that, fear, my fear that I would humiliate myself crept in again. Victor, I said, pulling him aside, you should go ahead without me. I'm not of the same caliber as the others who know how to act, sing, and dance. I could hear the minibuses approaching, and I was hoping he'd say there wasn't room for me after all. Instead, he reassured me. I'm very proud of you, Mariatu. You've come a long way with your healing. You've suffered so much, and look at what you're doing now. About to go on stage and perform. But aren't you afraid I'll make the theater troupe look silly? No, Victor responded. Quite the opposite. We are doing really good work here through theater to help the amputees. Having you on stage will help the charities see how important theater is to get them to support theater programs in other parts of the country. Besides, he said, tenderly rubbing my shoulder, we can't go on unless you're with us. We are a group, a family, and we won't be separated because you're nervous. It's natural to be nervous. If you weren't, I think there was something still wrong with you. I peeked out from behind the curtains once we'd arrived. Nearly every chair assembled around the stage had been set up in the stadium was occupied. I peered at all the faces, recognizing no one, although Solomon and his wife, Mariatu, had promised to be somewhere in the crowd. Many of the men wore suits, and some were white-skinned like the journalists. The day was hot, so the ladies in their crisp Africana dresses were fanning themselves with the posters we had made. Some of the boys in our group assembled themselves on stage and, with the curtains still drawn, began to drum. That was the sign that we are about to begin. The first part of the performance involved us all being out on stage, singing a song about the war that Victor and the troop had written because I was short, I had been in the front row. Victor pulled the curtains back, just as it was my turn to go on stage. I hesitated, but Mariatu right behind me gave me a shove. The bright spotlight startled me for a moment. I must have looked like a wide-eyed deer. Somehow I managed to find my spot, though, and I began singing along with the rest of the group. I soon forgot I was up in front of all those strangers. 
We sang and danced just like we had done in practice back at the camp. I said my line and wept in the HIV slash AIDS play. We got a standing ovation from for our skit on forgiveness and reconciliation. The event ended with us all together on stage, arm in arm. Salman and Mariatu found me after the performance. I was giggling with Mariatu and a girl named Memanuta, who had lost one hand during the Freetown invasion. Solomon gave me a big hug. I'm so proud of you, he said, wiping a tear from his eye. I'm going to miss you when you move to this place called Canada. Don't worry, Solomon, I said. I'm not moving anywhere. How wrong was I?